presence, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Holy Spirit. You always anoint your word. The word of God originated from you. You are the author of the scriptures. I thank you that the word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, that your words, they are spirit and they are life. And so, Holy Spirit, we look to you. We depend upon you. We, we have confidence in you that you will take the word of God, plant it in our hearts. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would create desire that you would create passion, that you would create an eagerness and expectation in the hearts of your people for more, more of your presence, more of your power, more of your anointing upon our life. Now, Lord, I pray that you would take the word of God today and that you would give us a freedom, enlightenment, O oh God, give us revelation and understanding by the power of the word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. Balaban natin ang Panginoon, so magan ito. Amen. Title of the message this morning is, The Holy Spirit in you is for you, the Holy Spirit upon you for others. So mean natin, the Holy Spirit in you, for you, the Holy Spirit upon you for others. The Holy Spirit in you is for you. The Holy Spirit upon you is for others. As many of you know, we've been doing a series of teachings on the Holy Spirit these last several Sundays. Uh, what we've learned is that the, the reason, the purposes, some of the reasons, some of the purposes, we, uh, we, we certainly didn't go through everything in the Bible about the Holy Spirit. There's so much in the Scripture about the Holy Spirit. But we did learn a few things about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. Amy Baba. He's not just a force, not just a power. The Holy Spirit is God Himself. Tayo po dito sa VCA and the great majority of evangelical churches all over the world. Uh, we believe in what's commonly called the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons, three separate functions. So God sent His Son Jesus, who died on the cross for us that he died, he shed his blood, he was raised from the dead, and that Jesus, the Son of God, sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now lives in us. Sabinathan, in us. Jesus told his disciples, the Holy Spirit is with you. He will be in you. Now, we're going to look at John chapter 20 here this morning in just a moment. We're going to look at how Jesus breathed upon the disciples and told them to receive the Holy Spirit. But then he also told them to go and wait in Jerusalem until they would be endued with power from on high that the Holy Spirit would come upon them. So the Holy Spirit is in us and he is upon us. He is in us and he is upon us. We found that even in the Holy, in, even in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was very much active. Amen, Baba. Wag po natin isipin, the Holy Spirit is only active in the New Testament. Just not true. Plenty of verses in the Old Testament show us the activity of the Holy Spirit. Even at the creation, the Holy Spirit was active. For He is God, He is eternal. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters. It was the Holy Spirit who was the manifest power of God that when God spoke, that the worlds were created, the Holy Spirit was always, always active, even from the very beginning. And so we learned also as well, the Holy Spirit lives in us to lead us, to guide us, to comfort us, to transform us into the image of Christ. He comes on the inside of us to change us, to give us a new heart, a new spirit. We become a new creation. We have a new nature by the power of the Holy Spirit. Every believer in Christ, every genuine follower of Christ has the Holy Spirit. Amen, Baba. If you are born again, anuman in your denomination, Baptist, Methodist, uh, whatever your background, if you are a genuine Christian, the Holy Spirit resides in you. Can you say amen? You can't be born again apart from the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God being born again is not a religion. It's not a set of doctrines. It's not joining a church or an organization. The being, not even being baptized in water. Bagamat mahalaga din to be baptized in water. But being born again is when God's Spirit comes and lives on the inside of your spirit and gives you a new creation. To me, not a new creation. 
Behold, the old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of every genuine believer in Christ. Can you say amen? He is in you primarily for you. Again, to comfort you, to lead you, to guide you, to speak to you, to direct you, to encourage you, to assure you, to correct you. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us to transform us into the image of Christ. Uh, last Sunday, we looked at how our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, both individually and corporately. God isn't that word temple. So I mean, not in temple. Now, the great majority of time, and it's not wrong, it, it is certainly a teaching in the Scripture, the great majority of time that you'll hear messages on our bodies being a temple of the Holy Spirit, then you'll hear messages about all the things we shouldn't do, you know, we shouldn't smoke, we shouldn't drink, we shouldn't do all these, and that's true. But, but I want you to think about the word temples, I mean, not in temple. What's the purpose of of a temple. And so we looked at the scriptures from the Old Testament, Mulasa Tabernacle, into the building of the temple, and even on into the New Testament as well. The purpose of a temple is to host the very presence of God. Amy Boba. All throughout the, the Old Testament, God expressed his desire, multitude of scriptures, that he wants to dwell amongst us. God wants, tell your neighbor, God wants to be close to you. That's the desire of his heart. It's been the desire of his heart since Adam fell in the garden. God has always desired to be close to us. And so he commanded Moses to build a tabernacle. Later on, Solomon took the pattern from the tabernacle, built a temple that God's presence, his power, his glory could be in our midst. Now, you and I are a temple. Tell your neighbor, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. Again, both individually and corporately, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in us. He resides in us to manifest His power, to manifest His presence. You and I are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and we should, in fact, keep these bodies free from anything that will defile us. Amen, Boba. You wouldn't go into, you know, before you were a, uh, before you were a born again Christian. The great majority of us here were, were were Catholic. You wouldn't go into the Catholic Church and have all kind of makarumul dumul nabaga. You would know instinctively that that is that that is, uh, you would fear God, right? Hello, well, our bodies. You have a temple with you everywhere you go. Hello, this body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. He resides in you. He dwells in you. We, we have to learn to become hosts of his presence. We have to learn to cooperate with him. All right, we learned that the Holy Spirit who was very much active in the Old Testament as well. I want to give, read you some examples this morning of some of the activity of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Primarily, you find in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit would come upon the men and women of God. So be nothing, come upon this is the difference between Old Testament Holy Spirit, New Testament Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit hasn't changed. He's God. He's always the same. But, but, but the way he functioned in the Old Testament, primarily the Holy Spirit would come upon men and women of God in the, in the Old Testament. He would empower them to do great and mighty exploits. And so I want to give you some examples of that in the Old Testament because we're studying the Holy Spirit. Let's say it again. The Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit upon you. I want you to understand these things. So from the Old Testament, it's true in the, in the New Testament as well, but the Old Testament gives us some clear uh, examples of the Holy Spirit coming upon people to do a certain task, something miraculous. We can read in the book of Judges chapter 14 of Samson. Judges chapter 14 and verse 5. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and his mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. So be not upon him. Now listen, this is, this is actually the anointing. This is what the anointing is. The anointing is 
a person. His name is Holy Spirit. The anointing is when God, the Holy Spirit, comes upon you for a certain task. He empowers you to do something beyond your natural ability. So the Bible is speaking of Samson here, says, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. So be nothing, upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. How many of you know that is beyond human ability? The Spirit of God came upon Samson and empowered him to do something supernatural. We can read again in Judges chapter 3 and verse 9 about a, a man by the name Othaniel. The Bible says, When they cried out to the Lord that God raised up for them a deliverer, Othaniel, son of Canaz, who was Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. Again, verse 10, The Spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war, and of course defeated the enemies of Israel. Because of the anointing, so be nothing the anointing, because of the anointing, God empowered him to do something beyond his own natural ability. And so what I'm trying to get you to see here is I'm trying to get you to see a picture of the Holy Spirit coming upon men and women in the Old Testament. The same is true in the New Testament. But the Old Testament gives some very clear examples of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon people and empowering them to do things that they cannot do in their natural ability. The prophet Samuel, who was one of the greatest prophets of old, he prophesied to King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 6. So the prophet Samuel is making a prophetic declaration to King Saul, and this is what he says to Saul. He says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily. So be not then upon you. So he's giving a prophetic message of what was going to happen to Saul. He says, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily, and you will prophesy with them and be changed into another man. We know that this did indeed happen on more than one occasion. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, came upon Saul, and he was able to prophesy, and he became even as another man until people were wondering, is Saul also a prophet? Now, the Bible tells us as well in Isaiah, Isaiah makes this prophetic declaration, Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. I personally believe that Isaiah was prophesying about himself at the time, but it was also many of the prophecies in the Old Testament have a dual fulfillment, many of them. And so uh, sometimes we read them and only get one understanding, but many times they have a dual meaning and a dual fulfillment. So Isaiah, I believe here in Isaiah 61, was actually prophesying about himself, but it had a dual fulfillment in that it was speaking about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would later come. And as we know, we'll read it in, in a moment, where Jesus himself quotes this passage from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is what? Upon me. So be nothing upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now here's something that you have to learn about the anointing. The anointing of the Holy Spirit always comes to do something. If you are anointed of God, it's to do something. It's not just to bless you. It's not just to give you goosebumps. It's not just to make you feel good. The anointing comes to do something. So be nothing to do something. The anointing is a person. His name is Holy Spirit. So he will come upon us. He will anoint us to do something. So Isaiah says here, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to do something. What is he to do? Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and, to, and freedom to the prisoners. This is the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes upon us to do something. I want us to look at uh, this premise this morning. The Holy Spirit is in us primarily for us, that he is upon us primarily for others. 
Again, he's in us to lead us, to guide us, to teach us, to assure us, to transform us, to comfort us, etc., etc. The new birth takes place, of course, through the Holy Spirit. John chapter 3, Jesus speaks of being born again. Born of the Spirit. To be nothing, born of the Spirit. So when you become a child of God, how many of you here this morning, you consider yourself a child of God? All right, you're a child of God. Listen, it's not, it's not figurative. Figurative means that you know, you, you say a picture to just give an example of something. It is literal. So, I mean, nothing literal. Are you a child of God? How does anyone become a child in the natural? You have to be born into a family, right? You, you are born into a family. The DNA of your dad, the DNA of your mom comes together. After nine months, you come out and you are born. So when we are children of God, the Bible says we are born of the Spirit. This is why we must be born again. We are born with a sinful nature. We get born of the Spirit, again meaning that literally, to be nothing literally, literally the Spirit of God comes on the inside of your spirit and creates a new being on the inside of you. You are born of the Spirit. You become a child of God. Again, Jesus, when he uh, appeared to the disciples after his death and resurrection, I believe that this is where they were first born again. Uh, let's, let's look over in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. This is after the death and resurrection of Jesus. In verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week. So, I mean, nothing, first day of the week. Now, now, I want you to picture this in your mind. I want, I want you to see the chronology here because we're going to see very clearly from this passage that not only did Jesus promise two separate experiences, but that the disciples had those experiences. So Jesus promised to the disciples, the Holy Spirit is with you. He will be in you. So be not in, in you. So it's better that I go away. I will send the Holy Spirit. He is with you. He will be in you. Jesus also promised his disciples, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Now don't get confused. These are not identical experiences. They are both the same one Holy, there's only one Holy Spirit, amen? <laughs> they're the same Holy Spirit, but they're two different experiences. And we'll see this clearly as we look further here in John chapter 20. John chapter 20, Jesus has died. He's risen from the dead. In the morning, you can read, you have to look at, you have to look at the, other, uh, uh, the other Gospels to, to really get the clear picture because they give different portions of the story. In, in the morning, Mary goes to the tomb. There's the two angels there, and they say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen from the dead. They run back. They tell the disciples. The disciples, Peter, at least Peter and John, they run to the tomb. They see that the tomb is empty. In the afternoon, Jesus is walking with two of the disciples on the road to, uh, on the road to uh, Emmaus. He's walking with two, two of the disciples, and he's hidden himself from them, and they invite him to come in, and he, and he comes in, and when they break the bread, suddenly their eyes are open. They see, oh my goodness, this is Jesus. He's raised from the dead. Those disciples then run to, back to the 11 disciples, and in the evening, so be not in the evening, so be not in the first day of the week. I want you to see the chronology here. Jesus died just before the Passover. The first day of the week, they go to the tomb. He's risen from the dead. Several things happen there. Mary Magdalene sees him alive. The guys on the road to Emmaus see him alive. Peter and John run to the tomb. They see that the tomb is empty. In the evening of that first day of the week, in the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. I'll note that little pass, that little phrase. The disciples were together 
with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. What day was it? What day was it? It was the first day of the week. It was in the evening of the first day of the week. This is the day that Jesus raised from the dead. He rose from the dead in the morning. And in the evening, they were together and they were locked in a room for fear of the Jewish leaders. They were afraid that it was the same thing that happened to Jesus was going to happen to them. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Verse 22, With that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So we not then receive the Holy Spirit. How many of you believe when Jesus breathed upon the disciples and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit? How many of you believe that the disciples at that moment received the Holy Spirit? I believe they received the Holy Spirit. There'd be no reason not to believe. Jesus breathed on them. My goodness, the, son, the resurrected Son of God has just breathed on them and declared, receive the Holy Spirit. And so we believe that at that moment, they received the Holy Spirit. I believe that's when they were born again. That's when the Spirit of God came on the inside of them and they got a new nature, a new a new creation on the inside. They received the Holy Spirit. They were born again. Yet Jesus also gave these instructions. The Bible tells us that for 40 days, we can read in Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 3. I'm not going to read that passage, but you can read in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, that for 40 days, 40 days, for 40 days, Jesus appeared to his disciples on numerous occasions Proving himself to be alive. All right? From the day of Passover, Jesus raised from the dead on that first day of the week. From the day of Passover to the feast, which is called Pentecost. I mean, nothing Pentecost. There are actually 50 days. There are 50 days between Passover and Pentecost. There are 50 days. For 40 of those days, Jesus appeared repeatedly to his disciples, proving himself to be alive. You can read of many of those appearances in the book of Acts. All right. On the first day after the Passover, the, the first day. So on the first day after the Passover, Jesus breathed upon them. And what did he say? Receive the Holy Spirit. How many of you believe they received the Holy Spirit? All right. Yet on another occasion, Jesus makes this comment to them. During this period, Jesus says to them in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, he says, I am going to send you what my father has promised. Stay in the city until you have been clothed with power. Somebody say power. Stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, again, this is during the time after Jesus' death and resurrection, the first day he breathes upon them, and then for 40 days he appears to them at various times, giving them instructions. So they have already received the Holy Spirit, to be nothing, on the first day. All right, on the first day they had received the Holy Spirit because. The whole purpose of Jesus, when he came and died on the cross and was raised from the dead, this is the reason he came. And so immediately after he was raised from the dead, he appears to his disciples, he breathes upon them, and he fulfills that purpose of you and I being born again. The Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. That's the, one of the first things he does after his resurrection. Breathes upon the disciples. They are born again. Then over this period of 40 days, he appears to them repeatedly. They had already received the Holy Spirit. Yet, yet, he tells them, go and wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. So you're not in power. 
Go and wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, again, this is one of the times that Jesus has appeared to the disciples. He says, you will receive power. Somebody say power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit does what? Comes what? On you. So be nothing on you. He's in you for you to make you a child of God, to encourage you, to assure you, to lead you, to guide you. He's in you for you, but he says, look, there's another experience. He's going to come upon you. Jesus gives these words in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. He gives these words after they had already received the Holy Spirit in John chapter 1. Are you here? If you just study a little bit, it is, very, it is actually quite clear. Jesus, the disciples, received the Holy Spirit in John chapter 20. That's when they were born again. During that period of 40 days, he appears to them over a number of days. On one of those occasions, he tells them, you're going to be endued with power. On another occasion, he tells them, wait in Jerusalem. You will receive power, not when the Holy Spirit is in you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So be nothing upon you. And then he tells them what will be the result of that. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So, what happens? What's the result when this, uh, uh, this second experience that they have, what is it that takes place? Well, the Bible tells us, excuse me. Let me read this first. Also in Acts chapter 1, not only does Jesus appear to them over a period of 40 days, in verse 4, verse 4 of Acts chapter 1, it says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, this is after the death and resurrection, sometime between Passover and Pentecost, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized but with water in a few days, you will be baptized, I mean, nothing baptized with the Holy Spirit. So here is a third occasion. This is a third occasion where Jesus is telling the disciples, this is a third occasion after they've already received the Holy Spirit in John 20. This is the third time that Jesus is telling the disciples, there's more. So I mean, nothing, there's more. So three times he's telling them, there's more. You received the Holy Spirit in John 20. You were born again. There's more. And here in Acts 1 verse 4 tells them, Wait for the gift my Father's promise, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If you flip over in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, you can find when this second experience takes place. It's in Acts chapter 2. It begins in verse 1. And it's very different from John chapter 20. It's a totally different situation, a totally different scenario, a totally different picture of what happens. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, so be nothing, 50 days after Passover. All right, that's very clear. The first day of the week, Jesus breathes on them, receive the Holy Spirit. For 40 days, he appears to them. At least three different times he tells them, wait for what my Father has promised. You're going to receive power. Fifty days passes. Now, you might be asking yourself the question, why, why does the Bible say for 40 days he appeared to them, yet Pentecost is 50 days? Well, apparently for 10 days he didn't. I'm assuming, I don't know this to be fact, I'm assuming the last 10 days. I'm assuming that for the first 40 days, Jesus appeared to the disciples, and, and perhaps the last 10 days, he stopped appearing. I'm not certain of that. But I do know he appeared to them for a period of 40 days, and I do know that Pentecost is 50 days after 
Passover. All right? So the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. If you go on and read the rest of the chapter, you find that the result of that experience that we've just read about, the Holy Spirit comes in, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's tongues of fire. John the Baptist had prophesied as well about Jesus. John the Baptist had, had said this, this thing. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance. There's one coming after me who I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So be nothing and fire. So John the Baptist prophesied that this would that, that Jesus was going to do this. In John chapter 20, they received the Holy Spirit, they were born again. In Acts chapter 2, there's no mention of Jesus appearing. He he doesn't show them his hands and his side. This is 50 days later. He did appear to them for a period of 40 days, but they're just up in this room and they're praying. In, in fact, the, the indication seems to be, if you read all the Gospels there and you read the book of Acts, the indication seems to be from the time that Jesus died on the cross to the day of Pentecost, it seems to be that the disciples, they spent a lot of time secretly locked in a room for fear of the Jews, you know, their master had just been crucified. The, the, the Pharisees were pretty upset because Jesus had this massive following and they felt like he was going to, you know, he was going to encroach upon their, uh, whatever, their religious status or whatever. They, they were jealous, obviously. And so, and the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were actually saying that Jesus was a false prophet, that he was a false teacher, etc., etc. So they had him crucified because of their jealousy and, and presumably because they thought that he wasn't really from God, which is ridiculous because he did miracles right in front of them, you know. So the disciples now, they're afraid. We all know the story that Peter... Three times denied the Lord, and he denied the Lord. Si isang katulong lang. Hello, katulong. Linapita sa isang katulong. Nagmura pa siya. Oh my goodness. Nagmura pa si Peter. I don't know him. P-I-P-I, -I, whatever. You know, I don't know what he said. So he was afraid. To me, nothing afraid. The Bible tells us, that the disciples were in this room afraid for fear of the Jews. They were afraid they were going to be thrown in jail. They were going to be tortured, maybe even uh, executed because they were the followers of Jesus who had just been executed. So the, the scenario seems to be that they spent quite a bit of time just praying sila sila lang. So there they are following the instructions of Jesus who told them, go and wait. In Jerusalem until you're endued with power. When Jesus appeared to them in John 20 and breathed upon them, they didn't go out and preach. There's no indication that they went out and preached. The indication is they spent the next 40 or 50 days seeking God, praying in secret again because they were afraid of what might happen. And then something does happen. What happens is the Holy Spirit comes upon them in power like the blowing of a violent rushing wind fills the whole house where they were sitting. Tongues of fire separate on them, rest upon them. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. They begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enables them. And the result of that is this. That same Peter who only 50 days earlier had denied the Lord, si isang katulong, he had told them, I don't know him. That same Peter who was afraid 
that same Peter is now suddenly filled with the power, filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He stands before literally thousands. I mean, not in thousands. And he boldly proclaims the gospel. How do we know it was thousands? Because the Bible tells us 3,000 souls were saved that day. So it's not likely that the entire crowd got born again. So, so we don't know how. There may have been 5,000. There may have been 10,000 people. I don't know how many people are, there were. But here was a guy who was afraid to say that he knew Jesus. Now he's standing in the same city where his master was crucified. In the same city where the religious people were hated Jesus. In the same city where Jesus had just died on the cross and they had locked themselves in a room. In that same city, now Peter stands before a crowd of thousands and boldly proclaims the gospel. And God gives birth to the church. Thousands of souls are saved. Palabang na Panginoon. What's the difference? What's the difference? Mga kapatid, something happened that didn't even happen in John chapter 20. Now, now how many of you know, probably the greatest miracle was, was John chapter 20. The greatest miracle is the miracle of the new birth. I mean, there's no greater miracle than the miracle of the new, it's, the, the new birth is a greater miracle than blind eyes opening, than the dead being raised. The new birth is the greatest miracle. Amen, Boba. That the Spirit of God could actually come and live on the inside of somebody and transform them. That the Spirit of God could turn you and I literally become children of God. That's the greatest miracle. Come on, Palavan. That's the greatest miracle. I love the miraculous, but there's no greater miracle than the miracle of being born again. Yet, the miracle of being born again in John chapter 20, when he breathed on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, we don't see that there was a sudden boldness. We don't see that there were suddenly signs and wonders and miracles coming through the lives of the apostles. Yet, in Acts chapter 2, this second experience, I mean, not in second experience, in Acts chapter 2, this second experience, when they are baptized with the Holy Spirit, there's great boldness. You can go on to read the rest of the chapter. Then they begin. Signs and wonders and miracles were done at the hands of the apostles. Now, before they were afraid of being put in jail, before they were afraid of being uh, executed, now they don't even care. Throw me in jail, it's okay. When I'm in jail, when I get out of jail, I'm going right back and preaching again. So we have power. Power to be a witness. This is the Holy Spirit in you is for you. The Holy Spirit upon you is to minister to others. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes for just a moment. I want to encourage you to turn your heart toward the Holy Spirit this morning. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Turn your heart toward Him. Just begin to commune with Him right now. He's here. The Holy Spirit is here. Jesus said if two or three are gathered in his name, that he's right here in our midst. When you walk into the room, everything changes. I want to encourage you to lift your hands toward heaven. We want more of you, more of you, more of you, God. We want more of you. Father, we thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to change us, to transform us. We thank you, God, that we become children of God, born of the Spirit. We thank you for the comfort, the insurance, the guidance that we get from your Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. 
We thank you, God, that you empower us to overcome sin. You empower us to overcome the difficulties of life by your Holy Spirit living inside of us. Thank you, God, for the peace, the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit living in us. There is more, there is more, there is more. Lord, we look to you this morning because we want more. You made a promise to your disciples that we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, that we will be your witnesses. And so, Father, we lift our hands in faith this morning and we say, fill us now. Fill us now with your precious Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Create a hunger, a desire, a thirst on the inside of us for more. God, we ask for your anointing upon our lives, that you would empower us. God, that you would use us for your glory, God. That you would use us to declare the resurrection of Jesus. That you would use us, oh God, to manifest the power of the risen Christ to a world that needs to know Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, there is more. There is more. We want more. Fill us. Fill us with your power. Fill us with your anointing, oh God. Holy Spirit, come. Make yourself real to each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just want to encourage you here this morning. Next Sunday, we're going to be praying. For anyone who wants to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to allow an expectation to grow in your heart. A hunger. God answers hunger and expectation. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And so I'm going to encourage you this week to spend a little time with God. To get upon your knees and say, God, I want to be filled with your power, want to be filled with your anointing. Lord, I know that there is more to being born again than what I'm experiencing right now. I I pray that during this week, you know, the disciples, they had to wait for 40 or 50 days. But they knew that there was something more. Jesus had given them a promise. You'll be clothed with power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Go and wait in Jerusalem until you receive the gift the promise of my Father. And so I want to encourage you this week. Spend some time alone with God. Prepare your heart. And come back next Sunday hungry and thirsty and desiring and expecting that God will do something powerful. God will do something mighty in your life. Whether you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the past or not, whether it's your first time, there is always, always, always more. There is more. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, that you would stir up faith, you would stir up desire, you would stir up a hunger and a thirst for more. Not not, not only in, in in the hearts of the believers here, in my heart, God, that you would stir up faith, you would stir up desire, you would stir up a passion for more. God, I know there's more. There's more. And so, Father, I pray you would make us a people who are hungry and thirsty, for more of you, God, that we would not be settled, we would not be satisfied until we were absolutely ablaze with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. God, we know there is more. Help us to seek you, to believe you, to press in, to take hold of your promise, O God, to expect to have encounters with you, Father. Lord, this is our prayer. This is our faith. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated.